expert. I want to annihilate, <laughs> eradicate, firing squad, electrocute. I want to eliminate competition. How many of you want to eliminate it? Me too. I want to help you do that. For over 20 years, in fact, this October is my 40th year in this industry. That's a long time. 40 years goes by fast. And for a long time, over 20 years, we've been tracking closing ratios. And this year, I've had 700 to 800 stores sending me their closing ratios, stores that I've not worked with, just to find out what's really happening with stores that I've never trained or consulted in. Right now, closing ratios are coming in in independently owned stores, not malls, independently, at 17 to 23 percent. That's poor. 75% of all people buy the day they shop, which what's interesting is I'm 100% or what does that mean? First of all, I don't like to shop. That's what that means. And I even call ahead and see if they got it. Because if I don't want to go somewhere that doesn't have it, have to leave and start the process over. So if I'm shopping today, I'm buying today. And a whole lot of people are like me. In fact, America's the most time starved nation in the world, and for shopping today, we don't have time to shop tomorrow. And I have two different closing presentations. One's four hours and one's eight hours long. And so I'm taking an hour out of two total closing presentations. So I'm going to go fast. Uh, I've never really gone too slow. So hang with me, take notes, and uh, we'll discuss it. If you have questions when I'm done, I'll hang around and we'll talk. To understand, though, how you're supposed to close. First of all, you've got to understand your own sales profile. And there's things I will say you'll never say on the sales floor. And that doesn't mean it's not good for you. It means it's excellent for me. It's just that there's things you'll say I won't. And while we're talking about this, I've trained in over 4,000 stores, and I've never met a human being, I've never met a gemologist, a lady or a man, that can wait on everybody that comes through the front door and close everybody they wait on. I've never met them. And you can't either. Different clients coming in want different profiles. Some want younger, some want older, some want a guy, some want a lady, some want the gemologist. I mean, they already have in their mind who they think they want waiting on them when they come through the front door. So to understand closing, the first thing that we've got to do is talk about your sales profile. Now, usually I'll spend 15 to 30 minutes talking about this, but as I said, we're going to cram a lot in an hour. 70% of all salespeople are called the serpentine style. What they do is they'll talk about jewelry, talk about the weather, talk about the Cowboys making a prediction, meeting the New York Giants coming true. And they'll talk about jewelry and babies and kitty cats. And a classic serpentine will follow the client to the door after the sales made and stand there for 30 minutes talking about nothing. You're one. Oh, you're asking, you know what? Seventy percent of all people walk in inner serpentine style also. Twenty percent are missiles. They don't talk about babies, football, camping trips, Orlando. They talk about one thing, the jewelry. They're usually a little more impatient. Their presentations take less time. We're going to talk about closes each individual uses, but they're more direct. 10% are called sneaks. Not a snake, a sneak. Now, when I started, I worked with one named Virginia. I was like 18, 19, and she was like 72, had been in the industry 54 years, and she got by with her. I mean, I'd stand next to her, and people that she's waited on for years, she'd say, Buy this for I slap the crap out of you. And that wasn't her chosen word, but they bought it. <laughs> I heard her say, buy or die. I've never used that one. <laughs> Probably my favorite one that I'll never forget. I don't remember if the guy's name was Hank or Henry, but it's one of those H names. And she goes, Hank, you're going to buy it. He goes, not. You're buying it. I'm not buying it. You are buying it. I'm not buying it. You are too. She's walking up. He goes, where are you going? She said, well, I'm going to call your wife Elizabeth. Come on, you're in here. You're not looking at it. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not walking back till I see money. I'm 
talking to the phone. You're either taking it or I'm calling. He loved it. They did that stuff all the time. Now, what is interesting is she could get by with it because it's who she was. But too many of us use standard clothes. I don't want to hear them in your stores anymore. Uh, can I wrap it up for you? I don't want to pay for it. I'll size white weight. Those three are out. <laughs> are you Zales? Gordon's cage. Are you in a mall? Uh, are you chain stores? No, don't use chain stores to close this. And don't say, well, let's see if we can get you to fill out credit that, you know? That's not how we're supposed to be selling. We sell feelings and emotions, you guys. So sneaks make up 10% of the profiles. Now, what they do that's different is they're the chameleon personality. They can start off like a serpentine or missile, sneak in behind the client, close in the class, and go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Now they're glad they bought it, they just don't know how they bought it. Now everybody in here is one of those dominant. You're all one dominant. Some of you might be slash part of two. None of you are all three. Well, I actually can't make that prediction, but I mean, it's pretty accurate. Because if one of you are all three, you need to be locked up on fourth floor, you're going to hurt somebody. We never know who's coming to work. So everybody's one dominant. Let me see the serpentine hands, please. Serpentine hands. Oh, come on, guys. Ten of you. All right, let me see the missile hands. Sneak hands. Okay, everybody's one dominant. We're not done. Next on your profile. Are you patient? Or impatient. You're not both. You can't be both. You're one or the other. Now, how we can weigh that, there's this little white haired guy sitting in front of you with the red light. Light turns green. He's fiddling around with something on the scene. Not looking. Now, to give you an idea, my wife would tell you that my bumper would hit his bumper. I'm going to shove him through the red light or green light or the intersection. So how do you measure pa patience? It's where you put yourself in a situation you just wait kindly, not honk, do nothing, just wait till it turns red and green again, or are you doing something about it? Now, by your expression, you're doing something about it. You're probably even talking to them. You're one of those car talkers. She thinks cars can hear us. No, car can hear us. Uh, yeah, there's people that talk to cars. That's crazy. And you can see them talking to your car when you drive a by. So, are you patient or impatient? Why is that important? I'll tell you why. Little old lady from Pasadena comes in, wants to buy a Pandora beat, and takes her three hours. I'm committing suicide. <laughs> Not going to happen. I can see that on my wife. My wife can stay with her for three hours. So you got to stay in your profile, do you not? If you're going to have success. Next on your profile, are you a dominant talker or a dominant listener? People say both. Not true. Nobody's 50-50. You either talk more or listen more. Now here's my profile. I'm a missile, extremely impatient talker. My wife, Beverly, is a serpentine slice sneak, patient listener, exact opposite. When we team sell, the client is DRT. I don't know what that means. Dead right there. <laughs> They're closed. She knows when to talk, I know when to listen. But you see, you've got to understand what your sales profiles are. Why is that so important? Well, if you put your profiles up of all your people in the back room, TOs improve. Now, two missiles can't sell together. Clients will think they're going to get the crap beat out of them. Two sneaks can't sell together. That's really weird. <laughs> and two serpentines that are talkers, and they're both on each side of the And you know how serpentines are? They both want to talk at the same time. The client's going, they're trying to listen to both of them. <laughs> that doesn't work. And two listeners that don't say anything working together, the client's going, say something. <laughs> so, 
to have extreme awesome success, you got to put together tailor teams. Missiles can sell well with serpentines and sneaks. Talkers well with listeners, patient with impatient. But when you put the profiles up, you've got to practice doing TOs, and I have a long presentation on those, and I'm really not going to get into those today. But a TO is not a turnover, it's a team opportunity, okay? And what is cool when you put TO teams together, your closing ratio in your stores, if you really practice it, goes up 50%. It's a lot. 50%. Uh, right now it's coming in at 17 to 23% across the country. Not good. Another problem that we had, closing, obviously we're not, is our inability to romance the product. And there's three things romanced, and I'm only going to talk about one of them. That in itself is a three-hour presentation, and that's the beauty, value-added statements, and the reason they came in. And we're supposed to be awesome at all three of those. And the one that I'm really going to concentrate on in a moment is value-added statements. But let's just talk about the beauty just for a moment. First of all, if you can't romance a product you're selling, you can't close it. Because that's your ability to create the desire to get the client's want. You can't close it. And some of you have been in the industry for a while, 20, 30 years. Let me see the 20-year veteran's hands in here. Oh, it's a lot of them. And you know what we do? Every morning we put the jewelry out. Every night we put it away. Every morning we put it out. Every night we put it away. Why don't you just leave it out? Save a lot of time. And after you've been doing it a while, like Miss Cunningham has, we get desensitized. You hire a new person. Never worked in a jewelry store to put the jewelry out. Wow! Look at that! Is that real? Man, I got to keep my rose. Somebody's been putting it out and going, shut up and put it out! <laughs> Jeez! It's just a two carat PS1 that triple zero with two matching landing ports. Good grief, shut up. And so, I write articles in the in-store about wowy people. We're going to do a presentation on it in a couple of days. And owners, salespeople, they email me back. One article, I had email, 900 emails in one month back off of it. And they'll say, Shane, nothing wows me anymore. I email them back. Is it about you? Who's it about? Who's it about? No, Walmart has customers. We have clients. I was at Walmart one time and I thought I was filming the deliverance. <laughs> have you ever been to that place? It's unbelievable. It's in America shops there. I didn't see one in the whole place. Unbelievable. So we get desensitized, and here's our words. They're real high, man. Beautiful, pretty, sparkles, gorgeous. We call it a nice dog. Don't you think we could be a little more creative than that? Don't you think you need to work on vocabulary and that? So take the commonality out and step up. The other thing I'll talk about briefly before I get into value-added statements is the reason they came in. There's three kinds of sales. There's coconut. Now, what's really awesome? When we get a coconut, why do you call it a coconut? Well, a client comes in, and they walk up to you, and they say, how much is that? You say, it's $59.95. What's your first name, sir? Jeremy? And Jeremy says, well, it's $49.95. And the client goes, I'll take it, and goes, oh, yeah! <laughs> Now, you know what to make you can get a coconut? We only get two or three a year. He acts like he did something. I that so bad. Nobody can stand it the rest of the day. <laughs> the reason it's called a coconut is it falls off the tree in the lap. Then there's the clerk ticket, the client coming in on a mission. Oh, that one. That chose to celebrate an event with you. 
got the car ticket. Client comes in, he says, uh, we want to get our daughter something. She's coming back from her fourth tour in Afghanistan. It's our 30th anniversary. Just had a fourth baby. Hanukkah, Christmas, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. And they got these reasons. And they pull the door open to come in and give you money. And I hear owners going, ah, oh, crap, here comes a client. <laughs> Four thousand stores. I hear it, and we get desensitized to that because we celebrate events with them all the time. And men do this; they come in jewelry stores. I've never in my life heard a lady do this in a jewelry store in a doghouse. Women never use jewelry stores to get them out of the doghouse. Men do, and we've got the doghouse to keep get her out. My best get you out of the doghouse. Uh, this guy came in, I didn't know who it was. He had on Harley boots, Harley leathers, Harley coat, and Darth Vader's black helmet. <laughs> Pulled up in front of the, the, our store and grand, grand new, gorgeous, Harley, gorgeous, loud. Pulls his helmet off and I go, well, John. And he looks at me and goes, Shane, I can't go home. That's bad. <laughs> now when a guy comes in and does that, we always think that he did something like, uh, we and then in the jewelry industry, we practice psychology and we decide how much they're going to spend based on how bad their bad was. So this is what you guys do. What you do? <laughs> We're nosy. What you do? And he said, uh, I bought a uh, Harley. Did I? I said, well, that's awesome. Congratulations. You don't know what you <laughs> My wife told me when we got married over her dead body that I never had a Harley. My buddies came by this morning and said, hey, John. Want to go to the Harley shop? Sure, I go. My wife said, You can get gloves, you can get boots, you can get t shirt, anything you want to know. Last thing I heard going out the door, you know the rules. <laughs> well, I, uh, oh. I got a bitter a little something. I said, Well, that, uh, we can take care of that. And I said, How much is the Harley? He said, 30000 Now, to give you an idea how long ago it was, I had a uh, four carat total weight, bizarre cap, a two carat center, VS1F, carat on each side around VS1F, all three matching lab reports, uh, in a J-Bell dice truck mounting, and it was 31,950. Now, how much would that be today? 80 something? And uh, so I showed him a little something, fit a little box, right? It's a little something. And he goes, wow, she said, I went, what do you plan on spending $60,000 in one day? And I said, John, that's not my problem. I didn't buy the Harley. You did. <laughs> that's my best. Get you out of the dog house. And I said, you got to spend more on her than you did you. He goes, I've got a plan. He goes, I know I want to get home. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, uh, the Harley was loud. He goes, I'm going to get it going really fast. And then a couple blocks before I get home, I'm going to point the clutch and shut it off and cough. Well, then what are you going to do? I don't know. And so they give you trigger words. But we take it for granted. And if you're also not romancing the reason on a clerk ticket, right before you express the price, you make the fourth tour in Afghanistan coming home a bigger deal than they thought it was. 30th anniversary, a bigger deal than they thought it was. Because we sell feelings and emotions, that's the whole reason they came in. And you're awesome at romancing the reason and making the reason a bigger deal than they thought it was. The price becomes insignificant. And the closing ratios of that romance. Wow. But what we're going to talk about the most is something called value added statements. And it's your ability to talk about money without talking about money. But to be good at value, uh, added statements and romancing the product, there's two things you need. Gemological knowledge, GIA, and product. If you have time pieces, you got to know everything about them. Colored stones, brands, you got to know everything about them. you got to know them. And people say, oh man, Shane, it's a career. I love it. And I'll say, how many of you have done GIA Diamonds 1 and 2 and Diamond Grading? And all the people would say it's a career, their hands go down. 
interesting statistic I just read, approximately 70, to, or probably 60 to 70 percent of all high school students that graduate from college or high school that do not go to college, after they turn 18, never read another book. I'm kind of reading five right now, and I'm right too. We don't self-educate. We don't. We don't self-educate anymore. Right now, there's enough information on your computer and on everybody else's in the United States that they can read everything there is to know about diamonds and go to GIA in California or New York and pass the GIA Diamonds 1 and 2 written test. Now, the grading part, you've got to have it in the hand. They don't even have to go to GIA. There's enough information they can pass it, and they're coming in your stores. And we allow clients to know more about our product than you do. If I was full-time retail again, and not training and traveling and training and working and consulting all over the world, everybody that worked for me would have GIA diamonds one and two done, and I'm pathologist on my premises. I would like to go to a neurosurgeon. They changed tires yesterday. Well, I can get on the iPad. It'll show me what to do. Actually, you can do that. It is on the iPad. Our youngest son wants to be a surgeon. He watches it all the time. Creeps out his mom. So what are value-added statements? They are tools that you use when you're romancing that drives up the perceived value of the item you're showing them. And it changes their perspective. For instance, I'll give you some. You're showing somebody a flatly mounted that's blank, that have diamonds blank, that have side diamonds, center diamonds blank. And they love it. You get to the price, and it's $27,950. And the client goes, $27,950? And I go, yeah, I was shocked too. You must realize that uh, they will remove 8 to 10 tons of your crust to get one troy ounce of platinum that's not as big as in that pen. I thought it would be much more. You're exactly right. I was shocked too. I just want to take care of it. All I gotta do is turn their thinking around. But you see, you don't believe in the prices either. You guys negotiate your diamond prices all the time. Why do you do that? Why'd you put that price on in the first place? That's not the price you're gonna sell it for. It's interesting. So what are value-added statements you can use when you're talking about diamonds? And then clients do this. Before you even get started, they come in and go, I know the markup you have. <laughs> well, I'm glad you realize they're so low. Now that you realize that, you're not going to ask me to come down now, are you? Which one? <laughs> they all think you take home a million dollars in cash in your trunk every night. <laughs> if we told them how low your margins really were, they wouldn't believe it. So here's some value-added statements about diamonds. Some of this is from the beers, some from my own research, but everything I'm going to tell you I can prove. The miners that mine diamonds tell us that it takes a million diamonds mine to obtain one one carat. Now before I go any further, you guys have carats in your stores that are 4900, 6900, 10,000, 15,000. Those are your prices. 80% of the diamonds that come out of the earth's crust are industrial grade. They're called Bort. GIA, the Supreme Court in their industry, that sets standards that jewelers follow worldwide, tell us that when you take the Bort or the industrial grade out, it takes a million gem quality diamonds, a million gem quality diamonds mined to get one month here. Now, a million doesn't sound like a big number anymore with the national debt. That's another discussion later. But it's a thousand piles of diamonds with a thousand diamonds in each pile. There'll be one place to carry it. And you'll sell that for $4,900? How can you do that? Actually, the price is a joke, but the joke's on you. And GIA says that gym quality diamonds is flawless to I3. And I've never sold an I3 because I thought it looked like frozen spit. I'd like to argue that one with them. But since that's not in the board category, so be it. Two carrots. 
the experts tell us it takes five million diamonds mined that are too quality to find one. And you'll sell for twelve, eighteen, twenty thousand dollars. Value added statements drive up the perceived value of the client's mind. The miners that take them out of the earth's crust tell us, and the dump trucks that are in your town that you see running up and down the street fall of the earth's crust. They tell us it takes 250 tons, 250 of those dump trucks, 250 dump truck loads, one ton dump trucks, to find one, one carat. Just to find one. They're so rare off the ivory coast of Africa, they have ships like Kirby vacuum cleaners, they have big hoses, and these miners that are divers, they go down to the bottom of the ocean floor, and they suck everything up off the bottom of the ocean floor, goes through the ship, and kicks everything out, and keeps the diamonds. They're so rare, they vacuum them off the bottom of the ocean floor, and you can sell that for them. I have accounts that are site holders, and I've done work for De Beers, and I've asked people what are the odds on a three carat, and nobody's got the answer. Hmm. Yeah, the price is a joke. Natural fancy intense colored diamonds, colored diamonds. They happen once every 10,000 times in nature, you guys. Once every 10,000 times. Doesn't sound like a lot until we break it down like this. And you have one carat canaries that you'll sell for 20. You have blue ones and green ones. Drop dead gorgeous smelly pinks. Natural fancy intense colored diamonds happen once every 10,000 times in nature. Now, let's back up. It takes a million diamonds mine to get a carrot. A million. It takes 10,000 one carat mine to get one natural, fancy, intense color. What is 10,000 times a million? Is that a lot? <laughs> I have an account on the West Coast that recently just sold a BS1 keratin natural, fancy, intense pink. Young lady bought it. It was 1.1 million. Is that a lot of money? Don't shake your head up and down. <laughs> Was that a lot of money? No. You know why she bought it? What? Because she could. <laughs> she wrote a check. And you know why you don't sell one carrot, two carrots, and three carrots or what? Because you don't have them. And you don't believe in them. And you don't believe the price. And you think they're a lot of money. Yet your clients come in with them all the time saying, Look what I got in into New York. I got gifts on a cruise. Is it good? Faster than sand. Yeah, looks fine. Watch. <laughs> And so you've got to be better at driving up the perceived value of whatever you're selling, whether it's time pieces, colored gemstones, gold, platinum, and you've got to change what they think. There should be two perceived values, the one they have coming in and the one they have after you're done. Now, the reason you do this eliminates price objections, drives up the closing ratio, and too many of us try to justify or apologize for the price of what you're selling, and you become a self killer because you don't believe in it. Where do you get this information? GIA, De Beers, reading, study. Simple little question. Those of you that have heard me speak before, don't answer this, please. But if somebody knows this, it's not heard me speak. Where do burst guns come from? Pretty simple question, don't you think? 
Where did the birthstones come from? A couple months ago, a lady said they came out of the ground. I said, I do that. Let people get so I had something to do with astrology, right? Exodus 28, Old Testament. Yeah, Moses had a brother named Aaron. He was a high priest of the Jewish nation. He was a Levite. Twelve tribes of Israel, Judah, Benjamin, Dan, Asher. It's twelve tribes. Levi. Levites, they couldn't have a job. They took care of God's temple. Different tribe of Israel every month they took care of their needs. And every time Israel went into battle, Moses put on something. It's 24 karat gold called the breastplate of righteousness. That purple gold cord wrapped through a gold chain. So heavy he couldn't pick it up. Others had to pick it up and put it over his neck. <laughs> breastplate had 12 colored gemstones in it. Four rows of three. You read about what's in each row. You want to research it far enough back, you can find out what color gemstone represented each month. And each tribe took care of the Levites' needs for a month, you know, cleaning their house, washing their clothes, taking care of all the things they couldn't because they were busy taking care of God's temple. And they knew whose turn it was by the colored gemstone coming up in the breastplate. Now, shouldn't we know this? 6,000 year old history in our industry. You can't read. You know what we do? You buy a cheap Chinese carryout. You go home, put your feet up on the TV, and watch dumb crap like American Idol and Survivor. <laughs> huh. And it doesn't do one thing to advance your skill set. And you are not displacing the previous presenter because they're getting better than you are. How many of you, let me see your hands, have a one-hour sales meeting every week. Let me see it. Four of them. Hmm. Not worth training our people? Not worth investing in? Oh, hum's okay? You gotta step up. Our youngest son, we have three boys from 35, 34, and 11. He was given to us when he was 46 hours old. The lady handed him to my wife at the hospital, and I said, let's take it. One of the greatest blessings I've ever had in my life. His name's JT. JT's been in martial arts since he was three years old. He's 11. He's done it for eight years. Last November, he was still 10. Trying for his brown belt, full contact, shoulder and tempo. He breaks boards with his elbows, hands, and feet. We've had four broken bones, collarbone, arm, ankle, and toe. Winners never quit. Quitters, though, they never win anything, do they? He had three tests to get his uh, brown belt. One night was an endurance night. He was in fifth grade. My fifth grade, beautiful little boy. I had to do 250 push ups. 250. Practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice does. We worked a long time to get up to 250, 10 years old. My father always said, Shane, your actions will follow your beliefs. What are your beliefs? What are your beliefs? It's okay for status quo to set in. Mediocracy, all right. Changing more batteries than you sell diamonds. Oh, they're a lot of money. You create your own recession. Yeah, your actions, they follow your beliefs. Every one of them. I want you to take back the diamond industry in your town. I want you to own it. We're going to talk about why in two days, but you've got to learn how to close, people. If you can't close, they walk out, and what's really scary, when they came in to make a purchase, if they leave empty-handed, over 60-plus percent, I don't know the exact number, it can be as high as 70, I don't know the number, 
but over 60% buy within the first two hours after leaving your location because you didn't close it. That sucks. They came in to give you money, and you let them leave and give it to somebody else. Serpentine sneak dominant used. 
Indirect causes trust your instincts. Do what your heart says. Those are indirect. Number five, put a star by it underline. It's called the reassurance close. What I'm going to say to you right now is one of the most important lines you will ever hear as a salesperson or an owner or anybody that's on the sales floor. Are you ready? Clients get their self confidence from your ability to give them reassurance all the way through the presentation it's okay to, to spend money. Clients get their self confidence from your ability to give them reassurance all the way through that it's okay to spend money. So the close isn't the ending. It's a process you do all the way through. If they don't hear closes all the way through, the reassurance closes, when you wait to the end, you've got to be more direct. You want to have one shot. Closes a process. I'm going to give you a nugget with the reassurance one in just a little bit. Reassurance closes. Man, she's going to love this. She's going to believe you did it. You know, everybody dreams of only one of these. She'll never take it off. She'll never forget this moment. Those are reassurance. Number six is question closed. Listen to me very carefully. Do not say, can I, may I, would you, let me. Can I wrap that for you? No. Absolutely not. Salesmanship, when you get there, is not about asking permission. It's professionally giving them permission or telling them permission to purchase. What color is wrapping paper in your store, sir? All right, what color paper do you want? We have silver. That'll work. Or while we're wrapping it up, how did you want to take care of it? You can do that. But don't say, can I wrap it up? And we, we try to add on. And I'll chase a rabbit here. This is part of this presentation. It's very important. When you add on, don't say, is there anything else? Can I show you something? Would you like to see? No, no, no. So how do you do that? Oh, we have the matches. This is part of the set. Oh, can I show you what goes with this one? That's how you do that. <clears throat> Don't say, can I show you something else? No. You can't. And then we make another fatal mistake. When you finally do sell something, the first thing you do is spin around and walk the point of sale. You told them they're done. Why are they not done? They quit buying, though, when you quit selling. You do it all the time. What are you afraid, chicken? If I try to show them something else, I'm going to kill the first sale. You don't have a lot of self-confidence, do you? The average Christmas shopper buys 15 to 20 gifts, and we sell them one of them. And then they go to the other grocery store down the street, and she didn't finish it. How do you add on a Christmas? How many others are on your list? Does your son have a timepiece? Does your daughter have a starter set down in stud yet? Do you have in-laws, outlaws? Your outlaws coming up to Christmas? You gonna get something for your in-laws? That would surprise crap out of, wouldn't it? <laughs> Question closes. How do you want to take care of it? While we're wrapping it up, how do you want to take care of it? You want a four six problem hand? When do you need it? Those are question closes. Not can I. Is that clear? Get can I out of your vocabulary. You know, our youngest is 11, but he knew when he was three not to use can I. I think child psychology is actually where children use it on us. <laughs> About ready to eat, hey dad, let's go get an ice cream cone. JT, mommy's fixing dinner. Yeah, but dad, I just talked to mom and she said, if it's all right with you, it's all right with her. Yeah, but it's spoil your dinner. Yeah, but Dad, you just flew in today and I haven't seen you all week. Can we go get an ice cream cone? Crap! <laughs> no means maybe, and maybe means yes. They don't say, can we go get what? <laughs> and you guys do it all the time. Something changes somewhere. Number seven is the assumption close. Sneak dominant. The question close is missile dominant. You all have closes that are dominant to your profiles. The assumption close will have the words you or yours, his or hers, he or she, pronouns show ownership, thank you. 
And sneaks are great at assuming all the way through the client is going to buy it. Now, did you know the average salesperson has three closes? Three. You got three. And I knew when I got in this industry, if I was going to survive with a super shark on the sales floor, plus the older Pattersons and two boys, four family members. You know, it's fine to work at a store there's four family members. <laughs> Did you know the hardest shift to float in the world is a partnership? <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, me neither. How much you pay me stay? It's the truth, isn't it? I mean, some of your wheels are on the like, what did she just say? <laughs> so what is amazing is, I knew that I had to improve. My dad said, Shane, don't prove yourself, improve yourself. And when I make a promise to myself, I keep it. So I promised myself that I'd write 10 closes out in the night, seven days a week, every day for a year. 10 a day. Every night before I sat down, I sat at my kitchen table for a year, on Sundays, on my day off, on vacation, seven days a week. I can still show you the legal pads. In a year, that's 3,650. You have three? I decided to do it one more year, and now I've written out 7,300 of them. Sometimes I duplicate one of the duplicated ones that I like, so I take them in my refrigerator, put them on my bathroom mirror, and started reading these things and memorizing them, and my closing ratio kept going up and up and up. And you can do the same thing. You can't. Or you can sit back and let the last presenter be more professional than you are still. You see, 60% of all clients can't make up their own mind. They're coming in to pay you to do that. Did you hear me? They're coming in paying you. Part of buying the jewelry is paying you to close it. In fact, they pay for your opinion. Does this look good? Which one of these do you like the best? Don't answer that. 50% chance of being wrong. So now I'll allow you to answer a question with a question. Come back and say, well, which one do you like the best? Well, I love this, and that's one you should have. If I can both buy it, why don't I get one that I don't want? <laughs> How hard is that? Then clients come in and go, really, I never want to think about it. And I said, well, I thought we thought about everything there was to think about. Let me know what we haven't thought about, but I have to think about it, right? Think about it. I go to church every Sunday, unless I'm on the road. I went out on a limb one time. I'll never forget this limb. I've only done it once. This lady said, well, you know, i got to go home and i got to pray about it. And I said, well, you know, I just got done talking to God. He told me to buy it. <laughs> and she bought it. Done it one time. Never forget to come in. Closing. Coming in, paying you to close the sale. Isn't that interesting? So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to give you a super nugget. And I'm not going to go over a few minutes, and I apologize. I apologize to you if you have another seminar you wanted to go to, or I apologize to in-store. But what I'm going to share with you right now is extremely, extremely important. I make more money on the sales floor than what I'm getting ready to show you right now than anything I've ever done. I found it out by accident. I used to record my presentations all the time. I listened to them on the way home, and they're called microwave cassettes. They're the kind of little tape, and I thought, James Bond. <laughs> but to turn it on, I had to turn it on when I saw a client come in, so I turned it on when they're standing in front of me. It would go, Ch -ch -ch. you know that sound? You remember that? So I'd see them coming in, I just push it on. I've listened to thousands of my presentations in my lifetime. I've been reading everything I can about psychology for about 40 years, especially on the sales floor and clients and what they expect. And horizontally across your page, horizontally, it's on the same line, no problem. Horizontally. Last night when I checked into this hotel, I got in like this young lady, real sweet, at the front desk, put me on the ninth floor, and I said, Can you tell me where the vertical transporter is? <laughs> The vertical transporter. Do you mean that grass part that you put stuff on? I said, no, man, that's a horizontal transporter. <laughs> I need a vertical transporter. Excuse me a second. 
Hey, Mike! Where's the vertical transporter? Mike came out. Don't know what country he's from. Do you need a vertical transporter? What are you going to do with it? Why is it going to get in to the ninth floor? Got to have fun, you know? We all have to laugh. Across your page, I want you to write. I want you to start this. Ask, listen, paraphrase, close. Ask, listen, paraphrase, close. Ask, listen, paraphrase, close. Underneath. Ask 
let's paraphrase close. I had more than I wanted to discuss, but I ran out of time. Uh, I want to thank In Store for having me. I'll stick around and talk to you for a little bit. I want to tell you we have our order form for our DVDs, programs one and two. Four-hour presentation on wowing, creating, three-hour presentation on closing. If you want your people to get fired up for Christmas time, we have them here. Uh, they're uh, 7 dollars They come with four workbooks. This is what they look like. You need to order them. If you want them processed while I'm here, just hand it to me with your information and visa card on it. I'll be home Monday. I'll be in the mail Monday. Go back by Wednesday or Thursday. God bless all of you. Happy Sally. Thanks for coming. So here's what I 
want you to study when you go home. I want you to write down the value-added statements about all products. I want you to drive up the perceived value of what you're selling in the client's mind. I want you to do reassurance, closes. I want you to have so many of them that you, you can't memorize all of them. That way, when you do the relationship questions and selling specific questions, you can do the ask, listen, paraphrase, close. You can't do it without reassurance because that close is always the reassurance close at the end. I want you to write down fabs, as many as you can. Two things from this. Number one, I want you to role play, ask, listen, paraphrase, close. And number two, I want you to start tracking your closing ratios. And I'll tell you how to do that when I'm doing the 20 clues class giving when they're ready to buy. So I'll do a little commercial come to that one too, all right? So thank you again. Okay, are we ready now? I have a question for you. All right. While you're getting ready for the fourth quarter, what do you think is the single most important thing that everyone here needs to be focused on for the fourth quarter holiday business? All right, you spend a lot of money on advertising to bring people in, don't you? a lot of money on building up your inventory for Christmas, don't you? Building these beautiful stores. So you spend a lot of money on stores. You spend a lot of money on inventory. You spend a lot of money on advertising. How much money do you spend on training your staff? <clears throat> Did you know your number one asset isn't your advertising or your inventory? It's the people working for you. We're only as good as our weakest link. Your people will totally control how much money you make. Uh, four of you raised your hands that you have sales meetings once a week. So the question is, train all the time. That is the number one most important thing you can do. You can spend all this money on everything else, but hey, you spend a lot of money on advertising at Christmas time? Well, closing ratio goes up at Christmas time, not because we get better, because people aren't just looking. Just look at Christmas is life. I'm just looking at y'all right, crap. That's a lot. They're buying. Uh, they said seven is fine, because that's the truth. So if you worked on training and improving the closing ratio, how much better is your Christmas going to be? That's the number one most important. Thank you very much. Thank you.